written are Masha Gessen, who is an acclaimed Russian-American journalist and the author of several books, including bestsellers, The Man Without a Face and Words Will Break Cement. Her work has appeared in The New York Times, Slate, Vanity Fair, and many other publications, and has received numerous awards. A longtime resident of Moscow, she now lives in New York. Her latest book is about or is about events centred around April 15, 2013, when two homemade bombs exploded near the finish line of the Boston Marathon, killing three people and wounding 264 others. The elder of the brothers implicated in the attack, Tamilan Sanaev, died in the ensuing manhunt. His, br his brother, Jokar, was sentenced to death in May 2015, but the appeal process could take years. We know what happened, Marsha's book shows us how and why. How did such a nightmare come to pass? Her book, The Sanaev Brothers, Hold Up Book, is a riveting search for the roots of terrorism. Simon Seabag Montefiore read history at Gonville and Caius College, Cambridge. He is the author of Potemkin, Prince of Princes, and the award-winning Stalin, The Court of the Red Tsar. He lives in London with his wife, the novelist Santa, Montefiore and their two children. The Romanovs, hold up book, were the most successful dynasty of modern times, ruling a sixth of the world's surface. How did one family turn a war-ruined principality into the world's greatest empire? And how did they lose it all? This is the intimate story of 20 Tsars and Tsarinas, touched by genius and madness, inspired by holy autocracy, tainted by remorseless killing and sexual decadence. Simon's book is also a gripping family chronicle. The Romanovs is an enthralling story of triumph and tragedy, love and death, a universal study in power. And we welcome you both here, Marsha and Simon. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, Marsha, is an expert on Vladimir Putin and has written a biography of him. Uh, Simon has written extensively on Stalin and the Romanovs. Um, my first question, what these systems cover hundreds of years, what do they have in common or how are they different? Do you want to start? Sure. Um, just to say, lovely to be here and lovely to see you all here. And um, thanks for that introduction, Mash. Great to be with you up here. Great to be with you, Sam. Um, and great to meet. We just met just before, which is uh, which is very nice. So, um, and I've never been to Perth, so um, joy all round um, here. Um, and what I met some said? kangaroos yesterday too, which has like made my whole made my whole trip. Which is just they're, what, what, they're so adorable. Um, so anyway. Um, I mean, one thing I, I think it's worth saying before we even kind of get into the Putin, which which I'd love to have your, your view on is, you know, the fascinating thing about writing about um, the Romanov dynasty or, or Stalin is that because the Bolshev, partly because the Bolsheviks were so kind of punctilious at keeping archives and keeping the documents, that we have such detail um, on how these people wrote to each other in the pre-email, pre-text um, world. And my book, The Romanos, is based on all these kind of, is, is based, among other things, on these kind of very intimate correspondences, which um, really give you an idea of how czars from Peter the Great, Alexander the First, Alexander the Second, even Nic and Nicholas the Second, spoke to each other. And even with Stalin, before long distance telephones, we have these amazing correspondences where he ran the country from Sochi or from his holiday dachas in the south. Um, I guess, Masha, we're never going to have that sort of detail about Putinism and Putin because of the era and because of secrecy. And because of his personal style. I mean, the man doesn't use a computer, uh, so there's uh, whatever communication comes out of him, which is very limited, is not, there's no written record of it. Uh, I, in a way, it's, it makes it easier to write about him because basically everything that he has, been, uh, he has produced on the record can be consumed in the course of a few weeks. Yeah, that, that, that makes, that makes research very studied, easy. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, um, he, so he does everything in personal contact rather than, he doesn't do emails. 
as far as you know. Not that we know of. I mean, he doesn't use a computer. He doesn't mm. use the internet. Right. So there's a big difference right away. I mean, in a way, we, this man is, un, is, un, is, is, is more inscrutable than any of the rulers of Russia beforehand due to, techno, due to sort of technical, technical modernity in a way. Um, even Stalin, we have thousands of letters from him. And Catherine the Great, of course, and Potemkin, for example, we have thousands and thousands of their letters. They wrote many times a day to each other in total intimacy. I mean, if you look at, say, Catherine the Great's letters with Potemkin, we, we have, I mean, they would talk about love, they would talk about their sex life, they would talk about whether to go to war with, with Prussia, um, whether to annex the Crimea, a subject we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, they would, you know, they would also talk about what art to buy, whether to, whether to commission Sir Joshua Reynolds to paint paintings in England and whether to import them, and of course about their health. And everyone in the 18th century was always talking about their hemorrhoids. Um, mm. So there's a lot of hemorrhoids. Mm. We're never going to know this about the Kremlin today. No. Or their gout. Everyone or their had gout. a lot of gout. Or their gout. Mm -hmm. um, Masha, I think, I think uh, Putin supposedly gets paid is it 117,000 rubles a year? Um, and yet um, a huge uh, house or dacha is, is being built for him uh, near or on the Caspian Sea. How do, the, how, does, how do you reconcile one with the other? Well, uh, yeah, that's on the Black Sea and uh, calling it a house or a dacha does it a, bit, a little bit of a disservice that's uh, <laughs> It's, a, it's more, yeah, you know, it's a large house. It's got uh, uh, two highways leading up to it, uh, an autonomous uh, uh, hydroelectric station, uh, an airport, a theater. Um, and well, uh, after the whole scheme that had been used to fund it was exposed in a series of publications about four years ago, and I, I write about it in some detail in, 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 in my Putin book, um, the Kremlin finally said that, that the dacha has nothing to do with Putin, mm. and after a while it was actually transferred to another entity, which is one of the ways in which he keeps his wealth. Mm. But it's actually, um, so you know, uh, there, there, there are plenty of rumors about uh, who a particularly large yacht uh, the, uh, the scene around the coast of Great Britain uh, belongs to, and uh, and who particularly beautiful houses in Spain belong to, and um, the Spanish investigators have been looking into this uh, for about ten years and have written a 480-page report on the on the subject. Uh, but um, uh, you know, Putin's personal uh, wealth is 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 a subject of, of, of great interest. But I actually really, uh, w the story about the palace in the Black Sea w fascinates me for a different reason. I really want to know, and this goes back to what Simon was talking about, what was he thinking? Right? Mm. So uh, there he was, uh, appropriating all this money over the course of over a decade to build this palace. For what? Did he think he was going to be able to peacefully retire to the Black Sea coast in Russia? I mean, this palace is not in Venezuela or in some other country that may possibly leave Putin in peace if he ever leaves power. Uh, and that actually, uh, to me, uh, you know, I don't think there's a sinister plan that he had. Uh, if he had had a plan, the wise thing to do would have been to do what Gorbachev did which, when he built his palace on the Black Sea, which is make it state property mm. and use it as his own. The fact that Putin didn't do that doesn't speak to the existence of a plan. It, it speaks to the utter absence of any planning, any planning horizon, which I think is one of the distinguishing characteristics of, of, of his rule. And actually one of the ways in which his rule is quite different from uh, probably any Russian ruler who came before him. Mm. Well, you raised some great points there. I mean, um, one thing is, is, is the tradition in Russia of a sort of complete lack of um, boundaries between personal and state property. Um, once you're in power, um, you know, I was speaking to an oligarch who's, who's one of the biggest oligarchs, and he was saying, I was saying, like, what's this story, what's this about Putin's personal wealth? He says, as long as he's in power, it's utterly irrelevant. I mean, everything that this Russian state um, controls, all its vast properties and interests belong to him as long as he's in power. That brings me on to the, a second 
and third, your second and third points, which are really interesting, which we should expand on. It's really, um, the first one is a plan, you know, an ideology, if you like, a, a guide. I mean, all great statesmen, and Stalin is, is, I mean, Stalin and Lenin, you know, two steps forward, one steps back, was one of Lenin's pamphlets, and Stalin followed exactly the same sort of strategi strategy. Um, even these kind of totalitarian politicians were capable of kind of politics, um, U-turns, steps back, steps forward, tactical maneuvers, um, and there are many examples of that. But nonetheless, they had a plan where they wanted to get in the end, and it was an extreme commun it was an extreme ideology. The Tsars, similarly, I mean, the Romanovs had an idea, you know, they knew what they wanted. They wanted sacred autocracy. They believed that was the only way to rule Russia. Um, Putin, on the other hand, and this is actually one of his great advantages in the short term, um, is that he doesn't have a plan. He is meandering without an ideology. And of course, a lot of people in the West say, God, I a lot of politicians, Donald Trump, um, and in England, various sort of right-wing populist demagogues now say, God, we really admire Putin um, enormously because he can, he's so brilliant in foreign affairs. We need some strength that, like, like that from our lily-livered, wet, democratic rulers who can't do anything and make any decision without many polls and consulting groups and negotiating with their allies. And so we end up with you know, Obama having no policy whatsoever in Syria, of course. But of course, this is, exactly, this is, this is exactly the point. Autocrats can make decisions instantly. That is the whole point of one-man rule. And that is why they can um, act very quickly. They can launch wars in a day. They can order missiles fired from corvettes in the Caspian to hit Damascus or, or, um, or, or, you know, or, or somewhere in Syria instantly, while President Obama, Prime Minister Cameron, President Hollande have to consult for months before they can do anything. That's democracy. Of course, when you make big mistakes, that is all, they also are made much more quickly, and they take longer to emerge. So you know, people should be a little less impressed with this form of government. But I think the third point that you make is actually one of the most interesting, and this is about succession. Uh, Marsha says, you know, it's funny that they should build this kind of colossal palace, because that's what it is, um, down on the Black Sea, because how strange. I mean, that suggests that someone's going to retire to this place, because Putin, um, you know, doesn't spend much time down there unless, you know, I mean, you know, that's where he's, if, if he's hoping to retire there, that's well and good. But then look at the system in Russia. No one's ever able to retire from ruling Russia, are they? I mean, well, mm. one man has retired. Gorbachev. Uh, no, actually Yeltsin. Yeah, well, Yeltsin Gorbachev retired. Gorbachev was yeah. Uh, yeah, thrown into, out. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Yeltsin, uh, Yeltsin sort of set out a model that Putin, I think, at some point wanted to follow and then realized mm. it was untenable for him. The model was find a successor who guarantees your impunity. And that was, uh, that's how Putin came to power. You know, that, 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 uh, that was his sole role. Yeah. Just sit in this chair and protect me from prosecution. They didn't think about what else he might do. Yeah, that's, that's, that's that. So succession, in other words, is the kind of key test of any regime's kind of um, democracy, legitimacy. And um, the, the, the fascinating thing is that Yeltsin could only retire um, backed as he was, surrounded as he was by his entourage, the, fam the family. He could only retire, people had made such vast fortunes in this group, if he guaranteed that his successor would protect him. And that was the sole basis of the handover, wasn't it, Marsha? Yes. Was, was that the sole basis of that handover. Now, if you look back over the history, um, Stalin constantly talked about retiring, um, especially after the war when he was ill and he had, a, you know, he had a coronary problems. Um, arteriosclerosis, he was exhausted. I mean, everybody who ran, any of the war leaders who ran World War II were just completely exhausted and sort of barely capable of functioning after, world, after the intense modern uh, military management of World War II. And Stalin was even, I mean, he often slept in his office during World War II. You know, he, was, he worked sort of 16 hour days. So when he, afterwards, he constantly talked about retiring. But anybody he has said, like, every time he said, you know, uh, Vosnesensky, you'll be a good, um, you'll be a good uh, a successor for me. Molotov, you'll be a good successor for me. He then destroyed these people instantly. Now, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't solely the property of sort of totalitarian rulers. I mean, Margaret Thatcher was exactly the same in England. Um, she, um, you know, she constantly appointed successors and then destroyed every one of them uh, until she, she was overthrown. Um, the point was, Stalin could, uh, wasn't going to give up power to anybody. And 
so, but he amazingly died in his bed without any kind of plan for how he should be succeed, how he, you know, for the succession. If you go back into the Romanov period, it's fascinating because until Emperor Paul, you know, who came to, came to power in 1796, there was no plan for succession. A czar could simply appoint anybody to succeed him. And they often appointed people who had absolutely no, weren't even in the line of succession. Peter the Great, for example, murdered his own son, tortured him to death, and then appointed his wife, who became Catherine the First. Catherine the First wasn't, was, was not just not a noblewoman. She was not of royal birth. She was actually a camp follower. I mean, not much above, from her origins, not much above a prostitute. She'd slept with, she was, she was marched into the Russian camp in just a blanket. Um, she was a remarkable person. She was probably Livonian, Scandinavian, Lithuanian, something like that. We don't even know what, what, where her family really came from. She succeeded him because he basically appointed her, or his entourage appointed her, and she became Catherine the First. So, you know, that is the most meteoric rise in modern European history. Extraordinary. And she ruled in her own right, the first woman to rule Russia in her own right. Um, so there was a tradition there of just appointing who, who the hell you wanted to rule. And that went all the way down until Catherine the Great destroyed her own husband, overthrew her own husband. And after her, her bitter son, Paul I, brought in a, 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 an order of succession, a very orderly order of succession. Only men could rule after that. Women were out. And um, so what's fascinating about the period we're in now um, with President Yeltsin, President Putin. And what's remarkable about it is like, Russia has gone back to, to a, an order of succession before 1796. You know, we've now gone back to a thing where presidents choose their own successors almost at random, almost at random, and they can appoint anyone they likes. And President Putin, I'd, I'd love to hear more about this, much, but President Putin has kind of put up several people, promoted several pe people recently, hasn't he? There's the defense minister who's named sometimes as a potential successor, and there's now a bodyguard who's been appointed deputy defense minister, is there? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think there's a succession discussion under, underway. I think Putin is planning to die in office, and he also thinks he's immortal, so he's basically planning to, to rule forever, which also raises questions to me about this palace that he built. Uh, but I want to pick up on, the, on, on your point about strategy and ideology because I actually think there's a huge difference between those two concepts. Uh, and it's really important to understand yeah. what Putin is doing in both of those areas. Uh, because I think that for the first 12 years of Putinism, which is basically from, uh, from the year 2000 until 2012, the, uh, the regime was fascinating in that it was devoid of both strategy and ideology, right? It's, uh, it's only... Uh, product was stasis, uh, which, which was called stability in Russia. Uh, but it also coincided with a period of unprecedented uh, the prosperity for Russia, just absolutely unprecedented, thanks solely to high oil prices, right? So skyrocketing oil prices, a lot of money coming in, and even with the ruling elite siphoning a lot of that money off, it still raised the standard of living consistently through 2008, and then to a lesser extent, uh, at least kept things stable until 2012. Now, uh, around 2011-2012, when Putin comes back into office after having Dmitry Medvedev, if anybody remembers that name, uh, keeping his chair warm, uh, he is faced with mass protests all over the country, which are absolutely terrifying to him. Uh, he's afraid of protests as such. He's, he's afraid of the mob. Uh, he's, and he thinks also that these people, because he identifies, as Simon pointed out, as every Russian ruler before him, he identifies completely with the state. Everything that's Russian is his. He is Russia. So if these people are protesting his regime, then they're protesting Russia itself. Then they're enemies. Then they have to be foreigners. And he's at war. That's basically sort of the logic that he's following. Uh, and that only fuels the desperation with which he holds on to office. And that, I think, uh, mark, marked a difference in his political regime, which actually acquired almost by accident, he backed into an ideology. He still has no particular strategy, but he has a very uh, classic sort of fascist ideology of uh, traditional values. The world is rotten, only, um, only Russia can save the world, and this gives Russia a mission. 
right? So he doesn't have a strategy, but he has a mission. And the mission is to establish a traditional values civilization, and protect the traditional values civilization around the world. Uh, this is quite different from the Soviet period when there was both an ideology and a strategy. The ideology was, uh, was, was uh, communism is coming and we have to advance the cause of communism. Uh, and everything is explained through class warfare, which is, and this is, this is essential for totalitarian ideology, it, it, it has to have one simple idea that explains everything and that shuts out every other possible explanation. Right, so Putin has that, right? Uh, everything is, is, for, uh, is for sale, uh, everything is rotten, and that shuts out every other possible explanation. And we have to establish the traditional value civilization as sort of the, um, uh, the ultimate goal. The difference is that unlike the Soviet rules, he has no strategy for getting there. It's his, his behavior is rather haphazard. It's not dissimilar in the two steps Forwards, one step back thing. He's constantly testing the waters. He's t constantly trying, you know, this the, this thing here, this thing there. If, if there's too much backlash, he will step step back. But he continues moving in the same direction, uh, and that does that does make him, on the surface, a, a brilliant tactician. I mean, I mean, it, um, I totally agree with that, and that actually does that does have more in common with late Stalin, with his kind of traditional, you know, after the war, during, you know, the very end of the terror and, the, and during the war, and after the war particularly, Stalin kind of, while, while keeping many of the features of Bolshevism and ideological features, he also started promoting a sort of rush, the Russian of the senior, the senior people in the Union of Soviet, Soviet republics, and, um, and a very traditional sort of, view of society and mothers and women and stuff, which was quite different from what Bolshevism had promised in the beginning. But this also takes us back to the Romanov, you know, the, the, the dynasty, because um, in, in many ways, this has more in common with the Tsars, who, you know, particularly in the 19th century. Um, in the 18th century, you had enlightenment, you had different things going on. But in the 19th century, you have Nicholas I, who in a way is the Tsar, who if you kind of compare, um, I think is the most in common with Putin. Um, you know, he's not, a, he's not a one of those kind of brand name czars like Nick, you know, Peter the Great or Nicholas II that we know, it, we, everyone knows a lot about. Um, but he ruled for a long time, about 30 years, which is an ominous sign. Mm. And, um, you know, he, um, he, was, he was an expert at keeping power. And he had an ideology that was somehow kind of similar to this. And actually, Putin is, is looking back at this with his, this since 2011, this, this new, this ultra-nationalist, this idea of Russia as a, as a, as a unique, exceptional civilization um, that, um, that has a mission to the world that is unquite like anything else. And this is very much what um, Nicholas I, um, he, he had an ideology of sort of autocracy, nationalism, orthodoxy. And Putin is kind of using, in a different way, using some of these elements as well at the moment. Um, he's saying that autocracy is the, you know, given all these kind of, this, these, 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 these kind of elements, these, these trash, foreign-inspired elements that are rebelling against, the potential re rebelling against me in a tiny, from a tiny sector of, um, of, of the sort of urban intelligentsia. Um, you know, we have to have autocracy to make Russia work. It's the only way. The Tsar said exactly the same thing. That was their ideology. Um, the Russian Orthodox Church has made a, a return to, to prominence and, you know, we, we, I, I want to, I'd love you to talk about that in a, in a second. And then, of course, there's the foreign policy, the ability to support other regimes that have a similar sort of autocratic um, uh, ethos. Um, so there are sort of parallels between the two. Of course, no era repeats itself. But this is, this is, this is a period, and of course, um, Nicholas I also went to war to advance Russian interests in the Middle East, in Constantinople and also in Jerusalem. And that led to the Crimean War, which led actually ultimately to the destruction of Tsarism and the, the system. It led to utter humiliation. Um, yet, for 25 years or so, Nicholas I was, was the most was the dominant man in Europe, the man who um, was regarded as a sort of political, tactical genius for pulling off things that no de democratic or Western leader could possibly do. So there are real parallels mm. there. But what about the Orthodox Church? What part does that pay now? So before I get to the Orthodox Church, I just want to uh, focus on some of what you said, because I think that it's, um, uh, 
the parallels with the czars are interesting and they're not coincidental. Putin fancies himself an amateur historian. He's been reading a lot of history and he has, um, in contrast to Soviet rulers, he's really aiming to, do, to create a sort of seamless historical narrative of Russia. Uh, the Bolsheviks did the exact opposite. You know, everything about the Soviet Union was different and opposite to the Russian Empire, which actually created a lot of identity problems after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Who were Russians if they weren't the Soviet Union? Were they a post-imperial state? Well, but the Bolsheviks said that the Soviet Union was not an empire, it was an anti-imperial state. You know, um, who were, what was the Russian tradition uh, if it wasn't the, the Soviet tradition? And uh, what could they draw on? So Putin is very much drawing this, this seamless narrative from Peter the Great to Joseph Stalin to Vladimir Putin. That's how he yeah. sees the great rulers of Russia. At the same time, the mechanisms that he had set in motion and the tools that he's using, really, uh, they reach back to Soviet times. They don't reach back to Tsarism. And there are key distinctions between tyranny and totalitarianism. Hannah Arendt wrote that, that in tyranny, a tyrant p uh, forces certain behaviors upon people uh, and, certain, uh, and, and the expression of certain beliefs. But uh, totalitarianism robs people of the very ability to form opinions. It completely eliminates personal space and the distance between people. The experience of living in a totalitarian society is very different from the experience of living under tyranny. And I think it's much more damaging ultimately to the psyche and much more damaging to the fabric of society. And that's what we're observing now in Russia. Now, uh, to your question about the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is playing, again, the same role it's played throughout Russian his its history in Russia, which is that it's, it's, the, it's, it's the other hand in the sort of the, uh, the, uh, the creature that maintains the Russian state. It's always been a state religion. Uh, it's always been part of the same organism. I often, when I, when I talk about my book about Pussy Riot, I'm asked to talk about the role of the Russian Orthodox Church. And it's really hard because how do you talk about sort of the role of the right hand versus the role of the left hand? They're attached to the same body. Uh, and that's a structure that actually existed in a very weakened form even during the Soviet period. I mean, the, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a Bolshevik myth that was propagated in the Soviet Union and is still widely believed in the West, which is that the Bolsheviks destroyed religion. That, uh, they did not. Uh, they greatly weakened the institution to ensure that they had full control of it. But they drew on its resources they drew on the resources of organized religion at regular intervals throughout Soviet history when they needed mobilization, when they needed aid in mobilizing society. For example, uh, most notably during World War II, at the yeah, very 19, beginning of 1943, the war. 1943, yeah. Uh, 1941, actually. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they, they called on the church to inspire the troops until they could figure out other ways yeah. to inspire the troops. And then they have, I mean, Stalin, you know, who of course studied, who'd studied orthodoxy at the seminary, yeah. um, and which in hugely influenced him, the seminary in, in, in Tbilisi, which is still there, by the way. Um, you know, he reappointed the patriarchate. And there hadn't really, I mean, there'd been a patriarchate for a very short period. Patriarch is the sort of pope of the Orthodox Church. Um, there'd been a patriarch for a very short period in 1917, but actually before then, Masha is right, um, Peter the Great had converted the patriarchate, had abolished it and just appointed, and, and, and converted the church into a state um, department the um, Ober Procurate, it was called. And, and so, so it really is it's just an organ of the state. Now, something very interesting is happening over there right now with the bones of the um, Romanov, the last of the Romanov family. And as you know, they were all murdered in 1918 in a horrible, um, bungled um, sort of slaughter, um, which I describe in the book, um, which is heartbreaking, by the way, when you look at all the accounts of the murderers. Um, it just couldn't have been worse, worse planned, worse conducted, more chaotic, more disastrous. I mean, the main problem was that all the Romanovs had sewn, we were wearing, effectively wearing bulletproof vests made of diamonds. They had sewn um, their, their di the Romanov diamonds into their underwear to carry it. And so when they were shot, many of them, um, the, the bullets just didn't penetrate them. And even when they were being stabbed with um, bayonets, they still 
they still didn't die. And they, so after all of this, after 20 minutes of shooting and frenzied stabbing, two of the girls were still alive. Um, so so that, was, that was a terrible event. The bodies were buried in two different sections. The first group of bodies was found in the 90s and buried in 1998. An occasion, by the way, when President Yeltsin gave what I think is one of the great speeches. Yes. Agreed. I mean, a speech that really is actually probably one of the greatest speeches on the 20th century, and it's, it's incredibly moving. It's not very well known, but he basically says, you know, we must repent of this, and we must realize that, you know, society can never be changed by violence and force ever again, and this, was, this is one of the great sins of the 20th century. And it's very short speech, and brilliant. And Yeltsin was an extraordinary character. Maybe yet we can go on to describe him. Um, so they were all buried in 1998, except for two of the children whose bodies were missing. Alexei, the hemophiliac Tsarevich, uh, and Grand Duchess Maria. Their bodies were found in the 2000s, but the church, playing an interesting game, which Masha may have some comments about. Do you know, I mean, have you followed this I story? haven't followed the details, so please keep going. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating story, but I'll, I'll explain, and then I'd love to know what you make of it, because mm -hmm. it is the most extraordinary thing um, the church, for mysterious reasons, which we can sort of, which I will try and guess, guess at, and Marshall will tell me if, I, if I'm right or not. Um, the church decided not to recognize, despite vast DNA evidence, these bodies were investigated by Russian and American scientists, which may be the problem. Um, they were, and Japanese scientists, all of whom, all of whom were convinced that the, um, the bodies were those uh, of the DNA of the Romanov family. Um, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, the Queen's husband, was one of the people who gave, um, who gave DNA to have this test um, made on the bodies. Um, the, the two other, when the two children were discovered, the bones of the two children, the church absolutely refused to recognize them. That was in 2006. They've spent the whole next 10 years in a box in the archives, and now, in, um, in two, just, just a few months ago, in 2015, President Putin, after all, only he could make this decision, um, has given his um, investigative committee, which is the leading sort of security organ now, running all the security services, justice. It's one of the sort of, it's effectively one of the power ministries. Again, uh, you know more about this than me. But they have now got together with the, the patriarch of the Orthodox Church and are having have exhumed all these bodies again to make tests on them. They've also exhumed the body of Alexander III, Nicholas II's father, and used the blood-soaked tunic of Alexander II, who was assassinated, as well as the DNA of Prince Philip, to again test all the original bodies and these two further bodies. And we are waiting to find out what is going to happen. Now, what I would, my theory is that the church is, one, was offended that, that Yeltsin had sort of um, had sort of deployed, you know, had sort of taken control of this process, which they believe belonged to the church, since they've made all the family into saints in 2000. And two, this is a way of reasserting orthodox control over sort of Russian life, hand in glove with the presidency of President Putin. And that P President Putin, probably not caring much about this, has allowed them to take it over. Um, and and otherwise, I just think there's a sort of obscurantist obstinacy here. Um, they have patronized some historians who, who follow weird stories about what happened to the bodies. Like, for example, that the bodies were all beheaded and the heads were sent to Lenin and Trotsky, and therefore they can't be the right bodies. What do you think is going on here, Masha? So, I actually think that Putin cares a great deal. Uh, and I think what's going on is it's a struggle, it's an aspect of the struggle for who controls history. And you're, I, I'm so glad you pointed to that Yeltsin speech because the Yeltsin speech in 1998 during the, uh, and, and part of what inspired it was that uh, Yeltsin was actually from Yekaterinburg, the city yeah. where the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the Romanov family was assassinated, was first kept captive there for what, eight months and then, uh, and the, and then, uh, and then slaughtered. Uh, and I think, uh, when he 
gave that speech, it was really the high point of the entire 1990s in terms of confronting the history and the legacy of the Soviet Union. Uh, he had been so busy in the early 1990s dealing with institutional transition, with privatization, with, uh, with the tr uh, transition to the market economy, that they sort of set the whole reckoning aside. It was not a high priority. I think this is probably the single biggest mistake made in the 1990s. And no was, Truth and Reconciliation Committee, effectively. Uh, no, I mean, nothing even close to a Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Uh, there was a scuttled uh, trial of the Communist Party. There, was, um, there were very sporadic uh, and sort of uninspired efforts to, uh, to create memorials to victims of the Great Terror. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a very short window when uh, uh, archives having to do with the Great Terror, with Stalinist terror, were opened for public access. And then almost immediately, the process of shutting them back down began. And I think that um, uh, I mean, part of it was that there were really a lot of uh, serious issues with, uh, with how they were going to run the state that had just collapsed um, and that had collapsed, uh, whose economy had collapsed. And I think that you know, there, there were sort of pragmatic reasons why they were so preoccupied with the economy. Um, but part of what was also was that Russia was faced with an absolutely impossible task. How does a country face a reckoning like that? This is, uh, the, the, the examples that are available to us in 20th century history are examples like denazification in Nazi Germany, which was A, occupied by another power at the time of denazification, and B, had, had had totalitarian, uh, a totalitarian regime for just 13 years. So it had, had, it had a living memory of what, it was, of what it was like to live in a different state. It also had a model available to it that basically said, there were, uh, there were victims, perpetrators, and bystanders in Nazi Germany. And you could claim that some, uh, this or that person was a victim or perpetrator or bystander and sort of have a scenario to cope, uh, to cope with it. Russia had none of that available to it. It also didn't have available to it the narrative that uh, post-Soviet countries in the Eastern Bloc used, which was we were occupied and this was done to, to us by someone else. And now that the Soviets are gone and that the Nazis are gone, we can go back to being the good people we always were. Right? So Russia had none of those tools available to it. It, was, it had to do it all on its own. It did not have an easy distinction to make between victims, perpetrators, and bystanders because everyone, uh, nobody was a bystander, everyone was a victim, and everyone is a perpetrator, not in equal measure but everyone was a little bit, at least a little bit of, uh, of, one, uh, of, of both. And Russia didn't have the narrative available to it that this was done to us by someone else. So the country had to say, we did this to ourselves. This unimaginable thing, this, this, you know, the, the business of killing millions of people in the most brutal way, the, million, the, the, the business of keeping millions of people in conditions worse than the Nazi concentration camps. We did this to ourselves. Uh, you know, my own family did this to members of my own family was what a lot of people would have had to say. And the only time that a message like that sounded was when Yeltsin said, we did this to ourselves. We did this, this violence to our own history. I think this is something that uh, neither Vladimir Putin can abide nor the Russian Orthodox Church can abide. And I think that's what's led to this very long period of doing nothing because they couldn't continue the narrative that, uh, that Yeltsin began. And now that so much time has passed, basically an entire generation has passed. They're going to, uh, you know, the, the fact that they've exhumed all the bodies is, is, is hugely symbolic, but also hugely practical. They're just going to redo the whole thing all over again and write the, uh, that, that very powerful Yeltsin sentiment straight out of history. Yeah, and but, I agree with you that sort of, you know, this regime does care enormously about history. I mean, all these new tech, they've, they've launched all these new textbooks, yes. which are presented in the Kremlin by the Ministry of Education as a sort of official textbooks now. And as the sort of, um, as the sort of narrative of what Marsh is describing, the, re kind of, the recasting of Russian history. And in these, it's very interesting because, um, because you know, Peter the Great, Alexander the First, Nicholas the First, these kind of czars are all presented as a complete continuum with Stalin and Russian and later Soviet rulers, you know, up to Brezhnev. Um, and they were all, they all presented as one thing. Now, 
by the way, Stalin actually privately believed this. And in, in World War II, you know, he brought in Order of Suvorov, um, he studied Kutuzov and, and War and, you know, he studied the sort of the story that's now, that was later told by Tolstoy in War and Peace. He studied, 19, you know, 1812, um, particularly when Moscow was in danger in, in um, 1941. And he himself, const Stalin constantly talked about, you know, how Russia needed a czar. All his private conversations, if you read them, are fascinating. He, he's, he's constantly aware of being czar. And um, of course, it's a different sort of czar than the, than the, than the Romanovs had been. Um, but, um, but, but he saw himself as a czar. He believed the Russian people needed a czar. And, and I'm sure that Putin is the same. And he, he, he is fascinated he, by both the history of Stalin and the history. I mean, his, his father, Marshall knows this, but his, fa his grandfather cooked for Stalin, um, was a chef for Stalin and a chef for Lenin. And at the Historia Hotel in, um, in, in St. Petersburg, cooked for Rasputin too. So, one hell of a world historical chef. Um, uh, and, and I'm sure that sort of, you know, that, touch with, that touch with history is something that in his early days, in his first presidential campaign, Putin put out, didn't he? As a sort of, mm. as a sort of link to, as a link to great names of, of, of history. Before. And, I, and I have major doubts about the veracity of those of those claims, but they're in, they're fascinating as claims. And they're in his auto, they're in a sort yeah. of autobiography that he. I mean, the very fact that he made them is what matters exactly. in Russia, mm. and that's true in most of Russian history, yeah, right? Absolutely. Before yeah. before we throw it open to the audience, a final query about Putin. Um, his term supposedly ends in 2018, but I get the sense you think he may still be there in in 2019 and beyond. Uh, well, I think he gets the sense that, <laughs> that he is to, will still be there in 2019. So, uh, when Putin was first uh, elected uh, president of, uh, of Russia, he was elected for a four-year term. And uh, the Russian, the hastily written Russian constitution said that a president can only serve two consecutive terms. Now, uh, the Russian language uh, doesn't lend itself to haste because... Um, <laughs> Uh, the Constitutional Court, in interpreting that particular phrase, and the, the Russian Constitution was very hastily drafted, uh, in interpreting that phrase, uh, the Russian Constitutional Court uh, pointed out that it could really be seen two ways. One was that it could, uh, a president could only ser could serve a maximum of two terms if they were served consecutively, but if he did not win re-election to the to second term, then uh, his, uh, his ter time in office was over, or you could read it as a maximum of two terms consecutively. So if you take a break, you can then serve another two terms consecutively, mm. uh, which is the way that Putin uh, chose to interpret it. He also then, when he asked Dmitry Medvedev to keep his chair warm for him, Dmitry Medvedev's first task was to amend the constitution to change the term from four years to six years, so that when Putin came back, so he, he had served eight years as president, then four years as prime minister, and when he came back, he came back for a, for a six-year term, and he, according to his interpretation of the Constitution, is eligible to run for another six-year term. By the time he's done, he's going to be, I think, 74 years old. And what makes me even sadder is that none of us are going to be much younger. Uh, and um, uh, there's, I mean, Putinism is not going to end because his legal terms, term in office ends. It's going to end in some way, either because he dies or because the regime implodes. Uh, not because I think there's particular reason that I see for it to implode, but just because it's a closed system. Closed systems eventually implode. None of them lasts forever. We are not in a position to predict when that's going to happen or what is going to bring the implosion about. We yeah, will I mean, see. I mean, um, there's, a sort of, there's a great story, possibly, possibly true, possibly not, that Putin talking to his kind of entourage at his, um, at his dacha where he actually runs the country most of the time um, outside Moscow was asked, you know, was, was, he was discussing history as he does and he was talking about, you know, great characters from, hi from history, great Russian rulers from history and he said, you know, I will never abdicate. I will never leave Russia to sort of mad men and um, enemies as Gorbachev did and as Nicholas II did. I will never abdicate. Interesting that he, you know, first of all, that he used that expression, and secondly, that he was looking at those two characters, and that he regarded, um, he regarded what they did as sort of abdicating power to madmen, foreigners, enemies. 
So this is the, this is the way he. This is the way I think he. I, I think he thinks that we know very little about really what he thinks about anything. Um, so the fact is that this system. I mean, we're right. There have been two rulers who did add, who had, had who temporarily abdicated or gave up. Power. You know, Yeltsin once gave gave power to Putin, and Putin once gave power to Medvedev sort temporarily. Of. Temporarily. Just a what's from what's it. interesting about it is uh, just talking about the workings of autocracy. Just just before we go on to, to, to questions, is that you know he was then prime minister. Medvedev was president. Actually, this is the way Russia has always worked. The autocracy belongs to one person. The person who that whatever that person touches with that finger of supreme power the, you know, is, is given temporary power. He can withdraw it. That is the way Russia's worked all along. Um, Stalin, for much of his reign, was not even prime minister, wasn't even head of the Russian government, was merely secretary of the Communist Party, but no one doubted who was the really in charge. And so this is, this is, this is in a way, the blessing and the curse of personal power. Um, so I, I agree with Ash that we're never going to, we, we, we know, I have no idea when this is going to change. Um, but the similarity through all these systems that we've looked at, communism, you know, um, monarchy, is, um, is, 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 you know, is, is, a, is a marked instability based on one person. The pattern has been the same. In three times in modern Russian history, 1610 to 1613, 1917 to 1920, the 1990s up to 1998, 99, is that there's been a time of great instability, great turbulence, great hopes for huge changes in society, in the state. And each time, Russia has returned to the same habits um, with, with, with a facade of different systems. And, you know, for example, now we have, a very, we have a democratic facade. But in the end, it's always gone back to one-man rule and autocracy. And it seems that, like this is just a return to the habits that people are most comfortable with. And, and I agree that th that looks like the future. I mean, if he ru rules till he's, he's 74, Stalin also ruled till he was 74, and that gives you an idea. One last thought is, in whatever system you're, t you're looking at, democracy, Putinism, um, the, the, the czars, um, uh, Stalin, um, or else in our Western democracies here in Australia, or in England, or America, but it, anyone who's in power for more than about 10 years goes mad. Mm -hmm. They're all mad after 10 years. That's all, I, that's, that's, my, that, that's all I've got to say on that. It's true. You look at photos of Bob Hawke 10 years after he became Prime Minister and he, he looked mad. Ken has the microphone. Um, plenty of questions. Perhaps this gentleman down the front, Ken. Thank you. Is there any... Can you hear me? Yes. Is yes. there any separation between church and state in Russia? No. No. There you go. Next I question. I agree. I agree. <laughs> we, don't need to, we don't need to say any more on that. Yeah, just to uh, be very interested to hear a bit of commentary on how both of you read that extraordinary sort of political relationship between uh, former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi and uh, Putin. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Putin famously uh, gave uh, Berlusconi a, a, this huge bed on one of his visits to Italy. And I, I think uh, in one of the WikiLeaks, um, WikiLeaks uh, uh, cables from the US ambassador, there's a reference to that relationship between Berlusconi and Putin. So what is actually going on there, do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, the one thing that Putin is different, you know, is very different from, I mean, to answer that sort of serious, that's, that's a great question, by the way. It has serious and preposterous aspects. I think we should cover both. Um, I don't think um, in Russia people will never know if, the, if there were bunga bunga parties in Russia. I don't think we'll ever know about it because, you know, there's, there's a tradition there of great secrecy um, in, the, in the ruling class, the ruling clique. And by the way, that sort of, the, the, the sort of system in the system in Russia that I think is in common throughout all these periods that we've discussed is that sort of tight a rule of one man surrounded by a tiny clique who are able to enjoy absolute power to enrich themselves as much as they like to do what the hell they like in private um, in return for a sort of ex expectation of security and prosperity at home and glory abroad mm. and I think that's part of what's going on here. Um, Berlusconi is obviously a preposterous, 
Poppin J, um, who, um, who is obsessed with his own sort of machismo virility, um, and, um, and is a very entertaining, if slightly alarming person. Um, but, and, and, and luckily of no importance in world affairs. Unfortunately, President Putin, on the other hand, of whom we know very little about his private life, maybe Mashin knows more, um, uh, is, 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 is extremely important. And um, actually posturing the bare-chested staff, riding horses, um, fighting, playing. Um, I mean, there's, there's, that, is, that is an air way of playing sort of a democratic leader and also demagoguery, you know, Mussolini spent a lot of time digging out marshes with his shirt off. Um, Pete, but, but again, it's quite like Peter the Great, you know, doing, show, trying to show that he's doing things himself. Um, that's part of it. I, I don't know what you think of any of that. Well, um, I mean, they are great friends, right? And, uh, uh, and there are parties. Uh, and there's, uh, there's great fun being had together. Uh, as far as I know, uh, Mostly in Italy, I don't. I have no information about what actually goes on in Russia, um, uh, and um, I think that there's uh, they're very similar characters, as Simon pointed out, and I think that the difference b between uh, w their impact that they've had and the role that they're both playing actually is 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 mostly attributable to the differences in the two societies in the two systems italy has however flawed the italian political system is it is able to keep that kind of abuse of power in check after a certain point and russia is not after to some extent and after a certain point but you know the damage that berlusconi has done to italy and the world it doesn't even begin to compare to the damage that putin has done to russia and the world now i think there's a there's a genre of that kind of man uh, that kind of politician and um uh, and there and there are very particular traits to demagoguery that they they offer right uh it's a sort of anti-politic politics it's an appeal to our worst selves Right. That is incredibly seductive. That's what Donald Trump is doing now. That's why there is a mutual admiration society between Trump and Putin. And whether, uh, you know, how much dam damage Donald Trump is going to be able to do, we don't actually know yet. I am not one of those uh, blindly optimistic Americans who say, oh, it's absolutely impossible and the Trump will get elected. It is not, unfortunately, I agree. impossible. Yeah. So.